An exoplanet is a planet, like the planets in our solar system, but instead of going around the sun, they go around a distant star. The study of exoplanets is a booming field within astronomy. And the um, difficult part about studying exoplanets is that the planets are very close to their stars and very far from the Earth. So it's very difficult to actually take a picture of another planetary system and to see the star and all the planets going around it. Instead, we usually rely on a number of more indirect measurements to study exoplanets. And the most informative, the most revealing of those measurements are eclipses. When we're lucky enough that the orbit of an exoplanet carries it directly in front of its star, then we can detect the small change in the brightness of the star. It gets slightly fainter when the planet is blocking a small portion of the starlight. So even if we can't make a picture of the planetary system, we still know that the planets are there from the shadows that they cast on the Earth as they go around. These are called eclipsing exoplanets or transiting exoplanets. The planet makes a transit across the disk of its parent star. When we see these transits, we can learn an awful lot. First of all, we know that the planet is there. We know about how large it is based on the amount of starlight that it's blocking. And we can see those transits repeat because every orbit the planet will go back in front of the star, and so we can measure how long it takes for the planet to go around the star. And that gives us some indication of how far away it is from the star. The further away it is from the star, the longer that it will take to go around. Those are the basic things that we learn from transiting planets. But there's actually a lot more. For example, we can even learn a little bit about what's in the atmosphere of an exoplanet by carefully studying the transits. The idea here is that when the planet is in front of the star, a little bit of that starlight is being filtered through the outer atmosphere of the planet on its way to the Earth. And so if we look at the spectrum of the star when the planet is in front of it, and compare that to the spectrum of the star when the planet is not in front of it, we can see the small differences that are due to absorption by atoms and molecules in the planet's atmosphere. So for these and other reasons, the transiting exoplanets have provided our most detailed information about these worlds that surround other stars. The field of exoplanetary science only really got going in the mid-1990s. That's when we started discovering exoplanets around other stars in large numbers. It really took that long partly for technological reasons, but also partly because we didn't know what to expect. Usually, when you start off on some scientific endeavor, it turns out, in the end, to be much more difficult than you originally in envisioned. That's just Murphy's Law applied to science. For exoplanets, it was actually the opposite. It turned out to be much easier to study exoplanets than anybody could have foreseen. And that's because what we had in mind was that planets around other stars would resemble the planets around the sun. And the planets around the sun exist in fairly distant orbits. Jupiter, for example, the largest and most obvious planet, exists at about five times the distance between the Earth and the sun and goes around every 12 years. So that would be, we thought would be the most obvious signal of a planet around another star would be to look for a giant planet like Jupiter, which goes around once every 12 years. That's very difficult to detect. Because, for example, suppose you wanted to detect the transits of Jupiter. You would have to monitor many thousands of stars, hoping for one whose Jupiter-like planet was oriented in an orbit exactly edge-on as we see it from the Earth, so that its planet would go right in front of the star. And that would only happen for one day out of every 12 years. Turns out nature was very kind. and. A lot of the planetary systems around other stars are very different from the solar system in such a way as to make the planets easier to study. They're much closer in, in many cases. We see lots of examples of giant planets like Jupiter, but instead of taking 12 years to go around, they go around every two or three days. 
and they exist very in tight little orbits around their parent stars. That makes them enormously easier to study because we don't have to wait as long for them to complete a full orbit and repeat their eclipses or to see the motion of the star that's made in response to the gravity of the orbiting planet. Everything is much faster and we, have to be, we don't have to be quite as patient to detect them. So the existence of these close-in planets was a, a real gift from nature that allowed this field to accelerate much more rapidly than anyone would have guessed prior to the 1990s. So that's very convenient. It allows us to study these planets more rapidly than we thought. And it also raises a lot of interesting puzzles. We had very good reasons to expect that planets around other stars would be like the planets in the solar system. According to our best theories for planet formation, you're not supposed to be able to form a planet in such a hot environment as it exists so close to the stars. So not only were these planets easy to study, but they raised some interesting scientific questions about how they got there, why they stay there, that we're still struggling to try and understand. The specific type of planet that I just mentioned, giant planets like Jupiter, but that exist very close to their hosting star, are called hot Jupiters. And the study of hot Jupiters, their properties, their orbits, how they formed, has been a major preoccupation of our field because we now know of so many of these objects. We know that if you pick a random star in the sky, like the sun, there's about a half percent chance that it will have a hot Jupiter. So they're rare, but not overwhelmingly rare. The galaxy still contains many, many examples of these hot Jupiters, and we know of hundreds of them that we can study in detail. The two big questions that we always ask in this field are, one, how do the planets around other stars compare to those in the solar system? In some respects, they're very different. In some respects, they're similar. And that should teach us something about how planets form in the first place. Where do planets come from? What is the full range of possibilities when stars are surrounded by planets? And the second big question is, can we find other planets that are similar in many respects to the Earth? Same size? same mass, same materials, same temperature, because it would be other planets like those that would be our top priorities in the search for life elsewhere in the galaxy. So those are the two big themes of exoplanetary science. How do planets form? And can we find other examples of planets like the Earth that we might one day search for life? The difficult thing about detecting planets technologically is that they're very small compared to the star and have comparatively little effect on that star. When a planet like Jupiter would get in front of a star like the Sun, it would block about 1% of the starlight. So in order to detect such an eclipse, you need to build an instrument that can register 1% changes in starlight. That's pretty straightforward. We can do that. To find a planet like the Earth going in front of the Sun, you need to build an instrument that can detect one part in, in 10,000 change in brightness. So the smaller planets require very precise instruments to detect. Another way that we have to detect planets is not to go after eclipses, but to try and sense the motion of the star. We always say that a planet is orbiting a star, but technically what's really happening is that both the planet and the star are orbiting their common center of mass. It's just that the center of mass is very close to the center of the star, since the star is very massive compared to the planet. And so the star's orbit around the center of mass is just a small wobble compared to the much wider orbit of the planet. But still, if we can make very good observations of the star, we can sense that motion. Specifically, we keep the star under surveillance with a spectrograph. We're constantly observing the spectrum of colors from the star, and the Doppler shift due to the star's motion can be detected in that sequence of spectra, betraying the existence of an orbiting planet. So there the difficulty is to build a spectrograph and a telescope that's capable of sensing very small changes in the wavelengths of the spectral lines that are being emitted by the star to one part in 10 to the 9 or better. 
so that we can measure Doppler shifts of order one meter per second or smaller. The other um, big difficulty in exoplanetary science and a real frontier area is making actual images of planetary systems, somehow coping with the extreme contrast between the very bright star and the very faint planets that surround it, and building special purpose cameras to either shepherd all of the starlight into a very narrow area and allow the regions around it to be searched for planets, or to somehow cancel out the starlight and leave a nice blank field available for searching for planets. And there are some very ambitious projects going on now to try and deal with those challenges of imaging planetary systems. Then on the theoretical side, exoplanetary science has been full of wonderful surprises, most of which have to do with the ways in which exoplanets do not resemble planets in the solar system. Let me give you a few examples. One is that we find giant planets that exist very close to their stars, even though in our own solar system, all of the giant planets are very far away from the stars. Another is that in the solar system, all of the orbits are very regular and seem very orderly in the sense that they're all very nearly circular and all of the planets' orbits are nearly in the same plane. There's not much tilt between different orbits. Exoplanets are not necessarily like that. We have lots of examples of planets that have orbits that are not even close to being circles, but are very highly elongated ellipses, more like orbits of comets in the solar system than planets. And we don't know, we have some ideas, but we don't know for sure why the geometry of the orbits can be so different. We also have some examples of planets that whose orbits are tilted by more than any of the planets in the solar system are with respect to one another and with respect to the equator of the spinning star. In fact, we now have examples, lots of examples, of planets that are orbiting backwards compared to the rotation of the star. That's very alien compared to the solar system where the sun and all of the planets are all sharing the same sense of rotation and revolution. And so one of the things we wonder about is how these systems got that way. Exoplanetary science is still very much in an exploratory phase. We're just seeing what's out there. What is the range of possibilities for planets around other stars? So it's enlarging our horizons about what is possible and is not um, in the planetary systems of other stars. We're finding planets that have uh, sizes and densities that are different from any of the ones that we have in our solar system. We're finding them on orbits that were, are different than any of the orbits of the planets in our solar system. And so we're still seeing um, the full range of possibilities.